It is an absolute honor today to be with the man, Rick DePaul Jr., who uh, comes from a long line of dentistry. Your dad was a dentist, and uh, it, it's funny. Um, love you to death, dude. You're a uh, well, you're one of the few general dentists who basically only does ortho full time. Yeah, I mean that's that's, right. uh, that's just uh, unheard of. And and I want to get into that. So first, first say first tell me um, what was it in dental school that made you? There's nine specialties. What was it in dental school that just made you dive into ortho? I know, I know you said, what, your dad's brother was an orthodontist? or Well, I have a lot of dentists in the family. My dad's a dentist, my sister, her husband. My uncle uh, is an orthodontist whose son is an orthodontist, whose wife is an orthodontist, and his other son is a general dentist. So we have a lot of people in dentistry in not, my not, family. Not, not to be rude, but is there a lot of inbreeding going on in your uh, in your deal? Has this been uh, looked well, into? I'll invite you to the family reunion and let you decide for yourself. How about that? <laughs> but I always kind of just liked that topic when I was in dental school, more so than restorative or peri or anything else. I also liked cosmetic dentistry as well because that was really up and coming and becoming a really big thing when I was in the dental school in the 90s. It was a lot of whitening and veneers, but I also didn't really like how that's the kind of way some of the bigger institutes came in and you'd have near virgin teeth that were basically prepared for three-quarter crowns and I thought that was a little too aggressive, which is kind of how Power Proc six month races came to be actually because I had two patients who were class two division twos with those incisors tipped way back and the laterals popped way out and one guy wanted me to do braces and the other girl she wanted me to do veneers on her. And what was funny was I had no problem at the time, you know, really preparing the teeth heavily. I think I had to do a couple intentional endos and things like that to do the veneers. Whereas the ortho guy at the time I was doing yes. traditional braces because that's how I was originally trained. And I told him it's going to take, you know, two years to treat you. We have to correct this molar classification, all these other things. He said the same thing that the Gale said. I don't like the way this one tooth is sticking out, the lateral incisor. Can't we just pull it back? And I had no problem, you know, preparing it on the on the gale, but not moving it on the guy. And then when I seated her veneers, I was looking at her occlusion, and I actually saw, you know what, her occlusion is exactly the same as the guy I told I had to change that occlusion orthodontically. So that's kind of when the light bulb went off, and I was like, why can't I just move the teeth to their most aesthetic position instead of preparing them? So that's kind of how... The whole Power Proc six month braces thing came to be, you know, coming up on 18, 20 years ago now. So I just tell doctors, think of it as orthodontic veneers. Not to say we're not moving the posterior teeth at all, but our focus is anterior cosmetic correction. We still open bites, fix cross bites, rotate molars and premolars all the time, but our focus is on anterior cosmetic correction. Again, think orthodontic veneers, and you really get your head around the concept around what we're trying to accomplish with this style of treatment. Well, you know, um, a lot of dentists, I, I believe the human mind is hardwired to believe what you want to believe. I mean, you start with what you want to believe and you work backwards. I remember when the cosmetic revolution took off uh, from 90 to 2000 and uh, all the guys in the field were saying they were having sensitivity issues and all the lectures and company was saying, oh, it's just you. It, you didn't use rubber dam. You did something wrong. You didn't mix it right. It's all, you blew it too thin. You blew it too dry. You know, it was all us. Yeah. And it was only the Japanese that actually listened to the market. And the Japanese introduced their uh, self-etching clear fill SE. And they just took like two thirds of the bonding agent because yeah. they're the only ones who thought, well, may maybe, maybe it is us. And, and they killed it. And, and another thing about these veneers that dentists don't want to talk about is that there's not a lot of research, but when you, peel off the enamel for upper 10 veneers. I'm going to ask you, in 10, 20 years, what do those teeth look like? How many of those teeth have died and needed a repair? Yeah. I, I mean, what would you guess? What would you guess? Oh, well, I'd say as far as endo, of course, it depends on how much you had to prepare them to get them into alignment. You might be looking at 30, 40% on I some know. cases. I know. I know. I mean, you, it's a ton. Yeah, a ton. And, and, and if you tell that to these cosmetic legend gurus out there, they're like, oh, well, you did it wrong. You know, it's, it's always us. You know, they, they never have any any of these issues and it says, and I, I just don't believe them. I don't believe it's transparency. I mean, if it was my granddaughter, um, I wouldn't let anybody file down her 10 teeth and put veneers right. on. She'd, she'd have to get um, braces and cleaning and bleaching and tooth whitening. I'm, I'm not gonna let someone 
peel her front 10 teeth off like a banana. I mean, I, I just think it's extreme. It's, a, it's an extreme makeover. If you're cool with an extreme makeover, I mean, it's your life, it's your body that's cool, but it's not very conservative. And what no, you're doing that, is incredibly yeah. conservative. That, and that's funny because when I first started, you know, kind of bringing this to the to the dentist, dental community and teaching it, everyone thought it was aggressive, you know, you're moving teeth fast and all this other thing. We're not really moving them fast. We just have a shorter race to run. You know, once we get our anterior cosmetic correction and have our, our posterior bite set to where that allows for stable results, all that's left to do is whiten, do incisal ledge bonding if needed, and that's it. So we're not having to go ahead and prepare teeth for, you know, 10 veneers and things like that. Now, obviously, if their teeth are really chipped, warm, modeled, you can still do them. But now instead of preparing to just get the teeth into archworm, into alignment, it's just very light preparing if you even need veneers and it's some 90 odd percent of the time you don't need them it's whitening and bonding after the tooth alignment so it's very conservative conservative treatment as opposed to aggressive treatment so can i just start with the uh the four thousand pound girl in the room that uh everybody else would dance around but i will go right to it what do <laughs> what do the ten thousand orthodontists think of rick DePaul, a general dentist going around teaching general dentists how to do six month braces. Now, the really smart ones will realize that if their general dentist in their area knows how to do things like power proc six month braces, even things like, you know, clear aligner treatment, that their eyes will be opened up to all the orthodontic problems in their existing patient base. And there's going to be people that as a general dentist, you don't want to treat orthodontically. So many of my doctors tell me that if, if they don't go on to learn comprehensive traditional braces themselves, they're referring more and more and more to the orthodontist. So the ones that are really kind of smart about it will actually, you know, help their general dentist in their area, you know, answer some questions, things like that, because they're going to get more and more. Also, we're going after a different market. Most orthodontic uh, practices are looking for adolescent patients. We're actually looking more for adult patients, people who didn't have a chance to get their braces when they were younger, or maybe weren't so good about wearing the retainers and had relapse. It's a totally different market that we're each going for. They want the younger kids. We predominantly want, you know, the adults, you know, in the, you know, 18 and up, so to speak. That is so true because I'm in Ahwatukee and it's about 80,000 people. It's actually Phoenix, but everybody calls it Ahwatukee. And um, there was a couple of orthodontists around and they weren't uh, near the high school. And then this Canadian orthodontist came down and sat right across the street from the high school. And I mean, his practice went crazy. So that, that and, and then he'll tell you that was his target market, high school sure. kids, yeah, I mean, high school kids. So, so then the other um, thing, explain where the name power prox comes from. And that's kind of a, a strange word. I mean, we didn't learn that word in dental school. Well, originally, you know, when I was trying to come up with a name for it, I thought of, at the time, all the elements that we use to treat out these cases, and it was primarily um, a mixture of the power of nickel titanium. It has that beautiful shape memory power that automatically moves the teeth to the desired position. So the power of uh, shape memory nickel titanium archwares plus reprox, which is just another name for IPR. Okay, so we do some IPR. Nickel Explain IPR. Markers. Explain IPR. IPR, interproximal reduction. When you have really wide teeth with bulbous anatomy, what I call interproximal mammalons, they've never been in alignment, so they haven't had a chance to wear during normal function. They're more bulbous. You see it all the time. You have one central that has a contact, the other doesn't, and it's got a huge distal shelf of enamel. So we're doing that interproximal reduction to get more balance to that final two sides in the smile and to allow the teeth to fit into that beautiful ideal arch form that the sheet memory nickel titanium arch wire sets into. So that's kind of where the word came from, from the power of nickel titanium plus reprox. Okay, I like to try to play the um, the, the guest of, you know, there's uh, going to be like about 2,500 people will only be seeing this on sound on iTunes. They got it on their smartphone. They're listening on the car to our commute. And I'm trying to guess what their questions are, what you're saying. Um, we're both older, so we understand when NASA invented memory wire. Explain what memory wire is, these kids who uh, didn't live through the invention of it. <laughs> memory wire is quite simply, what happens is you have this wire, and when you look down at an occlusal view of an upper or lower arch, you want to see that beautiful horseshoe shape. These wires are actually pre-made in this beautiful ideal horseshoe arch form shape. And when you tie that wire, which is very flexible, into all the crowded and rotated teeth, you go ahead and put those into the braces on the teeth, that wire regains that beautiful horseshoe shape, 
and brings the teeth along for the ride. So it helps to automatically reset the teeth to beautiful ideal arch form. So in a crowded case, that's going to gain space for you. In a spacing case, that can help close spaces. And also, plain and simple, it looks better because you have that beautiful horseshoe shape, that beautiful wide smile. And the wire does you know, a lot of the work, and you get a lot of the credit. So we'll take that every time we can get it. And that was brought to us by NASA. NASA it was it was Correct. NASA scientists who uh, noticed that they uh, they bend a copper wire. It just it's bent, but if they added nickel to the copper and bent it. It went back, and that's Absolutely. memory wire. And is that that's only right. a property of something with nickel? Is nickel only? There's there's various combinations, but nickel titanium is the combination that you use in orthodontics uh, to, is the most common. to get that. Shape and and also on that interproximal, uh, what do you call it? IPR inner. Interproximal reduction. I don't. You also think that um, when you're done with ortho, if those teeth touching each other, those contacts are very rounded. That's a lot easier to relapse than if you bump, you know, two square blocks together. I mean, don't you think a, right. a flatter the surface that they that you finish it in, the better chance of retention? That's one of the tricks, especially on the lower anterior teeth, where you have that rounded contact. The contacts are very small. Those teeth can slip off of each other. You can sort of keystone those contacts together to help lock them into position. We still get a beautiful anatomy on those teeth. When you're done doing reprox or IPR, you should not be able to tell it was done at all. But you can, especially on the lower anterior, again, keystone those together to help a little bit with, you know, longer term stability, less likely to slip off of each other. Okay, you, you picked, uh, uh, you explained power procs, but now let's talk about where did you get the name Six Month Braces? Because when I see Six Month Braces, I'm always thinking, did you see that movie Something About Mary? Yeah. Where, where that, that, that guy is in the car, the creep, and they're talking about eight minute abs. <laughs> and the guy says, well, what if someone comes out with seven minute abs? And he's like, you can't do your abs in seven minutes. <laughs> do you remember that scene? I sure do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I'm. Uh, so, what's stopping uh, me from um, starting a uh, five month braces? So, where, well, where, where did you get the six months? I, I, I got it because that was the average treatment time of my cases. Most cases range from four months to nine months. So, it's not a deadline. It's just an average of treatment times. So, once you reach your goals, you're done. And sometimes you reach that and three, four months, sometimes it might take you, you know, seven, eight, nine months. So it's just an average of times. It's not a deadline, which a lot of people think, oh, six months, take them off. If you're done, you're done before that. If you're not, you might go a month or so longer. So it's just an average of times. Okay. So, so what is, um, you, you're wildly popular on the lecture scene. You're wildly popular in dental town. I mean, my God, Rick, you got 15,000 posts on dental town. Uh, thank you for all the sharing that you've done. I mean, I think you've answered every ortho question for 20 years on that thing. I mean, thank you so much for that. But um, th this this dentist, she's driving to work right now. She's got an hour commute and she's driving to work and she's listening to you. And um, she didn't learn any ortho in dental school. I mean, she didn't, she didn't do one case. And she's been out five years. And uh, um, talk talk to that little girl. Why why should she go listen to you? Why should she get into ortho? I mean, why, 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 why does she need to do this? And especially when She's being pulled to learn like CAD CAM or CBCT or, you know, all, you know, there's bone grafting. There's so many things. You only got so much time in the day. Why should I learn this? Well, there, there's a lot of reasons. One of the key reasons you want to learn this is because patients actually want this done. They want straight teeth. They want a great smile. And when they want it, they're going to find a way to pay you to get it done. Okay, so they want this. They're going to find you. It's a great way to differentiate your practice from a lot of the other practices out there. Also, it's a fantastic general dentistry practice builder because a lot of these patients will come in. They haven't been to the dentist in five, ten years. They have tons of periodontal or restorative needs that you have to take care of prior to moving the teeth. I just tell them I can only move healthy teeth. In fact, we actually tripled our general dentistry in two years. Once I started marketing for PowerProx six month braces. So it's a great way to differentiate your practice, create a great um, general dentistry practice. Also, once you've done the tooth alignment, these patients that are cosmetically oriented, they want whitening. They're going to notice their incisal edges are chipped or worn. They're going to ask you to bond their teeth. So you're going to do the tooth alignment. You're going to get the general dentistry patient and you're going to get the cosmetic dentistry patient. Also, these patients have a tendency to stay with you long term. 
because you get to know the patient over the seven to ten visits that it takes over the six months, give or take, treatment time, you build these fantastic relationships with them. They're going to listen to your other treatment recommendations. They're going to stay with you after you're done. We have patients that drive three, four, five, up to nine hours away to get their teeth cleaned. It's amazing how dedicated these PowerProx 6 month braces patients are to your practice. So it's another fantastic way to build your general dentistry practice, build your cosmetic dentistry practice, create a marketing niche for you, and get these patients to stay with you long term. And you get, all, of course, all the benefits of a very controllable tooth alignment system. You have fantastic control when you're using fixed braces, clear braces, or lingual braces behind the teeth. You know, with your coated wires, I mean, you get those teeth straight, patients love you. They actually bring you gifts constantly. I get so much food from patients. It is amazing. It's a true story. The only thing I ever got from a patient who I did a root canal on, he gave me the finger. He said, it costs how much? And he flipped me off. That's the only thing I ever got from an endo patient. But I get tons and tons of awesome stuff from PowerProx six-month braces patients. It is amazing. So it's a fantastic thing to add to your practice. And, and I, I think that also um, humans, you know, you know if, I, if I've learned anything from 53 years on this planet is, is, is how complex the human mind is. I mean, it's just literally off the charts complex. And I think that when you look at people, like, you know, it's the phenomenon, like they don't, you know, they haven't been bowling for 10 years and there's no middle ground or they own a bowling ball and they have their own bag and they polish it and they go every week, you know, they don't own a boat, you know, it's all or none. And with so many people that they don't like their teeth, that mental health, they don't take care of their teeth. They don't brush, they don't floss. Once a human's body image says, I don't like my teeth, I think you gotta get their mental health first. And and they hate their smile, they don't hate their teeth. And once they fall in love with their teeth, then they take care of it and they shine that bowling ball every single day and they go to bowling leagues and they're they're in. Humans are either all in or they're all out. There's just no middle ground with a crazy human. And I've seen that so many times where, you know, they came in, they were an absolute train wreck. They haven't been to a dentist in 10, 15 years. And now you've given them hope. Right. Okay, we can, we can get you looking better, okay? And we can do it in a time frame that you're willing to accept because a lot of patients, especially adult patients, just won't accept treatment time that's 18 to 24 months. Of course, we offer it, but not so many will take it as, you know, around six, seven months. And then, we're, but we got to get you healthy. Now they're actually so motivated to get that general dentistry that they've been putting off to get it done. They don't say, you know, how much is my insurance going to pay for that crown? They say, when can I get in? So then they t- get ter- take care of themselves, and then you see such an improvement, not only in their dental health, but their self-confidence and self-esteem. You'll see these people just come out of their shell. I mean, it's really, it's actually one of the really cool parts of, of doing stuff like this. I want to frame another question, and like I say, it, it's hard for me to ask these questions because we got everything from, you know, the, the, these podcasts are rocking hot in uh, dental schools. So, you know, versus us, you've been out for 20 years. But so um, I want to ask you about another uh, 4,000 pound controversy off in the room, which is four bicuspid extraction. Um, Dr. Witzig, he was from Europe, wasn't he? Or trained in Europe? Um, uh, yeah, you used European techniques. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so back in the day when Rick and I were uh, kids, um, um, there was this guy. Back then, most of the orthodontists would pull four bicuspids to make it easy to make space. And then the other extreme was this Dr. Witzig who would never pull four bicuspids. I mean, I, I don't think I ever saw him do a case of pulling four bicuspids. And with most things in life, the truth is in the middle. You know, there's, right. a, there's a place for everything. The thing that I um, was frustrated the most about the four bicuspid extractions that I used to see, which made me get into ortho, is that a lot of times these orthodontists would just pull the four bys when the teeth just had all kinds of MOD amalgams and crowns that had to be replaced. And when they told me they needed, you know, six, seven millimeter spaces, the ones that would work with me, I could just take out all the crap and recurrent decay and amalgams and just make them with open contacts. You know what I mean? I, I, I could, I could usually get their space just by taking everything out of their arch. You know, usually, you know, if you got, you know, four MODs on, you know, eight MODs and a mandible, and they and half of them got recurrent decay, and you take all that stuff out. But when you get to your top model matrix, just don't make a bulbous contact. You can get a lot. You can get a lot of space um, just from redoing the restorations. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, in regards to once you're taking out 
you know, teeth like that, you know, you're definitely into a traditional orthodontic case, one that's typically going to take you 18 to 24 months on average. We don't take out premolars with PowerProx six-month braces because it's more anterior cosmetic alignment. There are indications for taking out premolars. Like you said, the truth's in the middle. Cases where the patient's what's called bimaxillary protruded just means their teeth and their jaws are so far forward, they can't even close their lips over their teeth without creating this massive strain in their face or their profile is so bulbous. Those are the situations where it's often, even the non-extraction guys will tell you, these are cases for four bicuspid um, extraction because you're trying to fit the teeth in while you're simultaneously improving the facial profile and the ability for them to close their lips over the teeth. Now, in those cases that are kind of borderline, you can definitely do that IPR in between all the teeth. Now, in PowerProx, six-month braces, we're primarily canine to canine uh, with our IPR. Sometimes we'll go back to the molars and more complex cases, but if you were to um, do your IPR from molar to molar, you can gain, you know, in a lot of cases, seven or eight millimeters of space, which is basically kind of like taking out a half a bicuspid on one side and the other. So you can kind of find a nice middle ground in a lot of those borderline cases when you have, you know, wider teeth or, or big MOD amalgams, like you said, bulbous anatomy. It's a little trickier when you have small teeth, but when you have wider teeth with lots of enamel, you can do that. I mean, that's what Jack Sheridan used to do all the time. You know, his was called air rotor slenderizing or ARS, which was just a more aggressive style of IPR. He did it primarily on the bicuspids. You know, he took a bicuspid that was that wide. He made it about that wide, left a little bit of enamel on there. His cases turned out beautifully, okay? But at the time, it was more controversial because enamel was so sacred. Actually, his nickname was Jack the Stripper is what they called him. Is he but still alive? I, that I don't know. I don't know. Now, what, what's it you said passed away? He was the first ortho yeah. course you took. What's it passed away? Correct. Yeah, he was so controversial among the ortho. Oh, yeah. Just... Second molar extractions and, yeah, a lot of stuff. Um, predominantly functional removable appliances with just some finishing with uh, with brackets and wires. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what I love about Dentaltown is, um, you know, these people are coming in from around the world and you get, you get to see things because uh, um, that, that's what he was doing. He was introducing European techniques. Right, yeah. And, uh yeah, and Jack Sheridan, I, I loved his course too. That was, he was amazing. Yeah, and um, since then, I've taken, I've taken just about everybody. I got a lot of training from Jay Gerber, um, Harry Green. I, you know, I've taken a lot of his stuff. I've read everything there is to read from Garrity and Rondo and all the other guys. Lingual from Mario Paz. I mean, you know, it's always continuous learning. You're never going to learn everything, you know, in a two day seminar. So it's just a matter of you know diving into that topic, finding resources that can help you do that. And just, you know, working your way up the ladder so you can, you know, be an expert in that, whether it's ortho or implants or restorative, whatever you want to do. So I got to, since you mentioned Harry Green, I don't know if you're aware of this. Did you know he lives in Phoenix too? I sure do, yeah. Yeah, he's my buddy up the street. And uh, yeah. we just had lunch a while back at his uh, favorite steakhouse with uh, Dr. Bill Summer. But anyway, did I ever tell you my Harry Green story? I, I don't never, think so. I had never done ortho. My uh, my Aunt Sue comes in and I was, uh, it was 87. I was 24 years old and... Uh, um, she hated her teeth, and she always talked about, she was 65, and she always talked about how sad she was. She didn't have braces when she was a kid. Her parents couldn't afford them in Parsons, Kansas, blah, blah, blah. And um, so I said, well, you know, um, let's do it for free. I would, But I don't know how. I, don't, I can't refer anywhere free. But I met this guy, uh, this buddy of mine, and I called him. I said, uh, would, you, would you come in here and teach me how to do braces on my Sue? And Harry Green, he's such a level guy. He said, absolutely. So he comes out, long story short, so we, we do braces on, on Aunt Sue. But what blew my mind is um, her husband, Pat, and her three kids, she always was a horrible migraine sufferer. And she had this incredibly huge overbite. Yeah. And they disappeared. And that yeah. was 28 years ago. And she's still alive. And every time I see her, she still rents and raves and asks me how Harry's doing and he cured her headache. So, so here's a woman that suffered migraines for 28, for her whole life. And now from 65 to 85, she hasn't had any. So t talk about that. Is, is that real? Was that in her head? What percent of headaches you think are occlusal related? Bite well, related? It, it was, it was obviously real for her. You know, a lot of people will have that situation. What I, what I tell patients that come in with with uh, pain or any kind of TM uh, issues is what I actually do is I usually put them in an NTI first. I want to make sure that they have something that's being caused by 
para function, clenching, grinding, what have you. Because I know if that's the case, I put them in an NTI, I can get them comfortable within a few months. That's kind of how I put my toe in the water, so to speak, when treating these patients orthodontically. Get them comfortable first. If I can, great. I'll go ahead and, and, and do ortho on you. If I can't, then, you know, they may have something like an internal derangement or some other structural problem, and it's just something that I don't want to kind of, you know, deal with anymore at this stage of my career. So those ones I'll refer on out to, you know, the orthodontist to do. But a lot of times, once you're opening up those deep bites, removing a lot of those in, uh, incisal interferences and things like that, give a better path of motion for the jaws to move around, a lot of times, a lot of those headaches will go away. Now, having said that, what I'll typically do once we're done with ortho in those patients, I'll typically have their nighttime retainer be a full arch NTI style retainer against like a opposing Essex, something like that. So they're still getting a combination of retention and clenching suppression. So you kind of can really make sure that they're going to be comfortable long term. Okay, so you used two words that I know a viewer didn't understand. Uh, you go back and thoroughly explain NTI. You threw that term loosely around a lot. Uh, NTI, um, it's uh, an appliance, it's an anterior midline uh, stop appliance that just contacts, it's, it usually goes on either the upper or the lower teeth, and there's a little ramp on it so the patient just bites onto their incisors. And what this will do is keep your muscles of mastication from clenching as hard. They clench at about 10% of the intensity when your back teeth don't touch. So it allows the uh, muscles to rest, not clench as tightly, and it can relieve a lot of muscular pain. Okay, and you threw out the word Essex. Oh, Essex is just a lower clear retainer, kind of like a clear overlay, overlay retainer. Looks similar to an Invisalign tray. Okay, so now um, the other, uh, I, I like to go right for the most, uh, I, I always try to think of what's the questions a proper person wouldn't ask. So the next one would have to be, <laughs> how much do you charge for this? How, 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 how much do they charge? Does insurance pay? Talk, talk about money. What I tell doctors to do is, you get fees vary you know, across geographic areas widely. What I tell doctors to do is charge about 75% of whatever the going rate is for traditional comprehensive braces in your area for PowerProc six month braces. And that gets you in the ballpark pretty darn well. You can actually charge less if you want. I've actually done some trials in, in charging less and we did get a little bit increase in volume. But about 75% of what, you know, typical comprehensive braces are going for in your area is a good place to set your fee. Now, I also offer lingual braces that go behind the teeth so no one can see them. What I do is I actually double that fee to do lingual braces. Because, because it's that much harder? Um, a, it's, it's, a, it's not that much harder when you select appropriate cases, but it does take a little bit more chair time, probably one or two hours per case. There's a little bit higher lab bill to do it. Uh, and also patients will pay more because they want it more because now not only is it fast it's invisible so they'll pay for what they want they want invisible too so so basically you just can't have an overbite with that right or they knock off the no actually you, you can have an overbite because there's a built-in bite plane right onto the front six upper brackets that they close on to and that allows you to correct things like deep bites and overbites and uh, things like that wow interesting well you know i always um when, when I was in school, in the first couple of years out, when that was first like introduced, uh, people were saying that you couldn't do them because their their tongue would get raw in the end. That their tongue would be playing with the lingual braces and would get raw, and and they they couldn't stop it. And so, is that a, has that been an issue for you? Here's what I tell patients. Okay, the first two weeks, whether you have outside braces on the on the uh, outside of the teeth or inside braces, lingual braces on the inside of the teeth, first couple of weeks, your teeth are going to be sore. With outside braces, your lips and cheeks are going to be sore. With inside braces, your tongue's going to be sore. Pick which side you want to be sore. After that first initial, you know, getting used to it period, they get used to it just fine, just like they do with labial braces. That's so a that great analogy. That has not been a problem. Idea it hasn't been a problem at all. And and, is, and back to fees. What what? It, so what is the average ortho in your area? Probably fifty five hundred, six thousand. So you're probably at probably four, at four, So you're probably at four thousand. I charge uh, forty two hundred for upper and lower um, clear. Power Proc six month braces. If I'm doing lingual braces, uh, both upper and lower, I charge eighty five hundred. So now, and that's just K nine to K nine, molar to molar. We so, go from first molar to first molar. Okay. So even so, though our so, goal so, is anterior cosmetic oh, okay. correction, we move the posterior teeth to facilitate that to not only help us 
make space for interalignment so we can reduce the amount of IPR that we need. A lot of people think we do like tons and tons and tons of IPR. Most of our cases are from one to three millimeters, if that, because we make space by derotating premolars, doing other things. Also, we're opening up deep bites to give you that wall of teeth look, better aesthetics, also to help reduce incisal interferences, heavy hits that can lead to relapse. So we bracket usually from molar to molar even though our focus is on anterior cosmetic correction, so we can get a better looking and a more stable final result. So you're bracketing the first molars. I I, I always uh, I I still put bands on first molars just because I still seem to have a lot of brackets on first molars come off. That's not an issue for you, or but you bracket mostly first molars. We, we we go ahead and bracket or tube the first molars all the time. The only time we use a band is if we happen to be using an appliance that's going to help us with some other things, which is eh, pretty rare. Only about five percent of the cases use an additional appliance. We haven't had too many issues. One of the reasons we don't have too many issues is because um, we usually place, if you have a deep bite, you know, then they have a tendency to bite on their lower and you lose a lower molar too, okay? But we use a lot of uh, buildups, bite raising buildups to help set our final vertical dimension, our, our vertical dental overbite, and that will also prevent those molar tubes from popping off as much. Not saying they never pop off because they will occasionally, but we have far fewer D-bonds doing it that way than, you know, if you just, you know, have that deep bite pounding on those lower molar tubes. Now, so you're charging 4200 for six-month braces, Correct. chiroproc six-month braces. Correct. How, how much is your course? The course is uh, 1997 for a live two-day hands-on course, and that also includes access to our case support and online seminar uh, website. So you up, there's an additional 17 hours of video training on there. You can post questions on our forum, post cases. The doctors that actually do the best have the most cases and finish them the best are the doctors that spend a lot of time on the site because it's set up for continuous learning. So yeah. you take the course, you go ahead and you start some cases, you post some cases on the forum, getting some feedback, you're already learning. Then once you've done a handful or you're halfway through a handful of cases, you watch the first level of videos again. You're going to hear things that you just weren't ready to hear the first time. Oh, absolutely. You're always going to hear something you know, different the second, third, fourth time you go through. And we have three different levels, so you just keep working your way up the courses, putting cases on there, getting feedback, re-watching the videos. It's set up so that you can become an expert as quickly as humanly possible. It's a really fantastic, massive resource that's available for our doctors, and that's just included with the live seminar. Yeah, so so basically what you just heard, kids, is that uh, for if you do this, your first case doubles your return on investment. I mean, if absolutely, you, if, yeah. If you if you do this for two grand, your first case should make four grand. I mean, it's literally it's literally if there is anything in dentistry, it's a no brainer. Um, but I I've always challenged your your uh, your site for your members because I I always thought um, and I'll say this in public, I always thought that was a strange business decision because. Your website where everybody's talking to each other, they're all preaching to the choir. They're all members and all that. I always thought if you put all that on Dentaltown with 198,000 people around the world, as those guys were all discussing, that that would be the best marketing you could get. Well, I've done plenty of that. Well, right. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. You have, 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 have 15,000 posts on Dentaltown, but yeah. I, I, I always thought uh, uh, like, like you're on like your uh, 17 hours of uh, uh, your your. Um, CE courses on your site. Yeah, yeah, I've done I've done plenty of that on Dental Town. I had a CE course, uh, you know, years ago on there, and I've obviously I posted a whole bunch of cases. You right. know, you kind of get the best of both worlds. On Dental Town, you get kind of people that don't really know about it. A lot of people who are you know opposed to it for whatever reason, and you know, that kind of brings a whole bunch of different opinions. What's nice about you know our um, case support forum is yeah we are preaching to the choir. We all know what the goals of the treatment are. Everyone's on board, so we can all help each other treating cases, getting the best results for our patients. So it's kind of the best of both worlds in a way by having you know some posts on Dental Town and having posts on our case support forum because we can help the people that are dedicated to you know power procs on the one side and people that are still learning about it on the other. And what what is that that website is six six months braces dot com, right? Yeah, if you it's, go to six month braces dot com and just enter it's the not the, it's portal. not the number X S it's S I X month braces dot com. So Correct. so so Rick and this this kid's driving to work and he's thinking this what what if I get halfway through a case and 
and I, I don't know what to do. And I don't know who to refer to. Who, who's going to bail me out if uh, five months into this thing I realize I don't, I, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm lost. I don't know what to do. Well, first off, I do help a lot of doctors who have learned from other systems and don't know what to do. So I'm always available to help. I don't care where you started, who you, you, know, who you learned from, whatever. I help people all the time from all over the world. I'm there to help you. And in taking my class, you're probably not going to get in that situation as frequently because we're heavily, heavily, heavily based on diagnosis and treatment planning. So you're going to actually know which cases to treat versus which cases to refer right off the bat, okay? So that's probably not going to be as much of a problem. I teach you how to do orthodontic thinking. So you're going to know what to do and why you are doing it so you can think your way through all those clinical scenarios really easily. So chances are you're not going to be in that situation. But if you are, all you got to do is post the case up on the forum and we're all there to help you and we'll kind of dial it back and get you back into a situation. So more likely than not, you're... I'm going to be the one to help you and we'll be able to get you back on track. Okay. So, um, so basically I, I want the dentist to, th you know, the, the average dentist get about 20 new patients a month. So, so I want the dentist to think back on, on the last uh, month, last month's 20 new patients. Um, what type of patient would he be looking for? And, and since this is braces and cosmetic and all that, is it more girls than guys? Is there a certain age range? Is there a typical patient or, or is it all over the board? Um, it can be all over the board, but we do have a tendency to get people in roughly the 25 to 45 year old range, a little bit higher female, but you'll treat a surprising uh, number of men, more than I thought. I thought it was going to be 75% female, but it's probably 60-40 or 65-35 in favor of female, because that's kind of who we're really kind of going for. We're not wanting to treat necessarily young kids with this style of treatment. We're looking for more, you know... Uh, more adult patients who either miss their window for braces or have relapse, because those are the people that typically aren't going to want to okay, necessarily but, wear braces that but, long. But, but again, I, this dentist is thinking about last one's 20 new patients. Uh, like, like, like how, do you, how do you approach this? Because like if I came to you and um, you said to me, uh, hey, Howard, look at my gorgeous hair. I'm Rick DePaul. I got beautiful. You, you should wear a wig. I, I would be, I mean, you, you can't go up to a girl and say, um, you know, you'd look a lot better with uh, straight teeth. Do uh, you realize how much prettier you'd look like if you straighten your teeth? I mean, so you, you, you can't say something like that. Right, right, uh, So right. How, how do you, so of this doctor's 20 last patients, you're saying key in on the 25 to 45, and that it's really boys and girls. How, how do you approach this? Okay, do you, I get do you. Just, do you just say, hey, are you tired of looking short, fat, and bald and want to <laughs> look better? And by the way, for all the viewers on there, uh, I've known Rick for 25 years, and he is wearing a wig. That's uh, absolutely. That, that's yeah, common. You, I'm, that, I'm finally busted. <laughs> I'm, I'm outing him right now. But uh, but uh, so how do you approach this subject? Well, actually, you can just write in the hygiene department, have your hygienist just say, ask the patient if they see any bit of like, let's say they see some lower anterior crowding, which you see every single day in your hygiene chair. If you just say something like, hey, Susie, if there's a way we could straighten these teeth, give you a great smile by the time your next cleaning visit rolls around, is that something that you want to talk about? Right there, they're either going to say, yeah, you know, this one tooth here has been driving me nuts for 30 years, and I've always wanted it straight, in which case you can now open the conversation to talking about things like power proc six-month braces, whereas they might say, ah, it's been that way for 30 years, and I don't care about it. Then you know not to barrage that patient with a sales pitch. People love to be told their options, but they hate to be sold stuff. So this allows you to determine which patient that is. So that's how I would approach it in a new patient who didn't come to you specifically for power proc six month braces. The, the only time I am suggesting it, and I suggest a lot uh, periodontally based where I, I set them up and I show them the panel and I say, um, um, we, I say in dentistry, we have our own BMW and it's the biological minimum with the bone. And the bone in between each one of these lower anterior teeth, it, it's got to be a millimeter and a half thick or there's not enough interstates carrying in white blood cells, red blood cells, food, nutrients. And on yours where they're all crowded with this paper thin bone, you know, you're 35. I can fast forward you to 65. That's going to be a perio nightmare. Um, you know, 30 million Americans don't have one tooth in their head. One fourth of seniors have zero teeth. One fourth have less than a half. I don't like the fact that you don't have a BMW between these lower anterior teeth. And that, that, that is true, and it would bother me. I wouldn't let any of my four boys um, have paper-thin bone in between their incisors, and I, I fight that stuff all day long. 
So the BMW is a good is a serious opening. Oh, absolutely. Um, because do stations, they still call it that BMW or biological uh, minimum width? Probably. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll have to check the uh, Perio uh, uh, forum on Dentaltown to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But, yeah. But, no, you definitely get periodontal benefits as well when you have, have situations like that. And, actually, a lot of people that are doing, you know, Perio Lays Lanap style treatment, you know, a lot of those patients really need ortho when they're done with that. So it's a good combination for people offering that. You know, once you're done with your fourth quadrant of, of, of Lanap, you pop into – some type of orthodontics to line up the teeth to help equalize the bone levels and all of that. Yeah, that there's definitely it's not just cosmetic. That's you know what it's most commonly used for, but you definitely get ancillary benefits from periodontal uh, condition as well. There's no doubt about that. So, are you doing any metal metal brackets, or is it all clear? I'm, I do pro, uh, primarily clear. I, the only reason I offer any type of metal at all anymore is years ago my assistant found out that if you buy like 20,000 metal brackets. They're like, you know, a nickel cheaper and I couldn't return them. So I have them on the menu for people who are on a really tight budget, but primarily we're using um, clear brackets. Which is kind of silly because then they, um, then they put a crazy color rubber band on it. I mean, it's like they want oh, clear yeah. so you don't notice yeah. and they put a purple, red and pink band on there. I, I think all the time. I, I think the, I, I think the, the metal in the mouth thing is so weird. Like uh, the thing that bothers me the most is you know, you want to treat other people like you want to be treated. All my restorations, I have like seven, and they're all gold, and they'll all be permanent. And, uh, you know, you just see woman after woman come to your office with gold earrings, gold bar through her nose, gold bracelets, watches, wedding rings, gold everywhere. Then I say, can I put a gold onlay on your back molar? And they just freak. And then they yeah. want these clear brackets, which makes no sense because they got silver jewelry all over their body. And then you give them the clear brackets, and then they – choose bright orange on pink and purple rubber it's like it's beauty makes zero sense uh yeah especially especially the kids will do that more so than the adults but you know it happens all the time i mean all the time we had uh i think my oldest patient i ever treated was 75 years old and she would match the color uh, o-rings on the on the braces to whatever her church choir was wearing for their upcoming concert that month so you know she at least had some fun with it to match her dress and, and the rest of the choir but yeah i mean it's kind of funny if the if the the kid begs his parent for them and then yeah they go ahead and do the, the do the colored uh uh o-rings on them so rick explain this phenomena that i don't understand you know i'll give you an analogy on implants um you'll you'll um find dentists you know placing a single root form implant first molar to first molar is twice as easy as removing a wisdom teeth yet 80 percent of the doctors who remove wisdom teeth just think that you know an implant is just too much for them he's exactly opposite you know doing a root canal is hard um no no offense to you but uh you know a second molar root canal is harder than what you're doing agree or oh, disagree? i agree yeah <laughs> I agree so 100%. so why so why do so many dentists who pull wisdom teeth and place implants and do endo not do not go to your course. I, I just don't get it. Well, a lot of it, I think, is fear of the unknown. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people don't learn a whole bunch about ortho in dental school. And it's kind of this big, mysterious kind of uh, uh, treatment modality that they just kind of don't understand. So I think that's a that's a big part of it. Also, they're, they're often worried about, hey, if I don't know how to plan out this case, what does happen if I get in trouble in the middle of the case? So it's a lot of just plain and simple fear of not knowing what to do and how to deal with any kind of complications that occur in the middle of treatment. Well, we, we've solved all that for you because I'm going to show you how to plan the cases out and you have immediate support on the case support forum and CE site. So you don't have to worry about those things. We guide you through things anytime that you're having any kind of, of questions or issues. All you got to do is post a question. I mean, we have guys that went from zero ortho, never took one ortho course, never did an ortho case, who went from zero to over 75% power proc six-month braces in their practice in just a couple of years because they hang out on the site and use that continuous learning. So um, it, it's a really easy uh, available entity for you to learn, you just have to take advantage of what's there for you. You'll be able to learn it. You just have to be a little bit dedicated, spend some time, just like any modality. You got to spend time, take some courses, and follow up with with reading. And the fact that we offer excellent support just is another massive, massive benefit. Have you have you tried making this mandatory part of the curriculum in the uh, 56 dental schools? 
because because they uh, a problem with the dental schools that they're all in big cities and yeah. a lot of and they have all these specialty departments and they don't realize that a third of their class is going to go to rural america with zero specialists and what's uh, sad about these dentists in these small towns that don't do uh what you're teaching them how to do um six month braces is that you'll tell the mom oh needs ortho uh, and then she's like, it's going to be 24 visits over two years. And the orthodontist is an hour and a half down that road. And she's like, we ain't doing it. So now this little kid, you know, is, is, uh, not going to get ideal treatment. And because you, you didn't make it a uh, easier, you know, faster, better, you know, it's easy. And, uh, um, when I, when I hear these, um, philosophers about, you know, what we all should be doing or not doing, they're, they're never thinking of rural America. They're never thinking of Eloy. They're thinking of Phoenix. They're never thinking of Arizona City. They're thinking of Tucson. You know what I mean? And it, mm -hmm. we, and we live in a country with two worlds, the urban and the rural. And the rural dentist is, is the jack of all trades. And uh, the, these rural dentists, they, they could just, uh, they, they, I just really think they should see your course. Uh, yeah, I think it would be a, a, a great way to help a, a lot of their patients because a lot of people tell me that, you know, they have same kind of thing. You have to drive 100 miles to get to any specialist. When my dad graduated, he went up to work in uh, Red Lake, Minnesota uh, for the Indian Health Service. And there, the closest oral surgeon was something like 200 miles away. So he'd have someone come in with a broken jaw and he'd just tell them, okay, I'll give you some pain meds for tonight. You come home uh, or you come back to the office tomorrow. And he would go back to his house and read in his oral surgery book, how to fix broken jaw. <laughs> and he had to be the one to fix it because they wouldn't drive. So absolutely, you know, if you learn these things, it, you know, you're going to be able to help tons and tons of your patients that you wouldn't normally be able to help. You would not believe this. So the la so I had a, uh, a car issue and it was kind of emergency issue. And uh, this, uh, I had to go to uh, the garage that was right next to the 7-Eleven. There was a, a garage right there. And I pulled in there and I and this kid was uh, was fixing it. And I said, uh, so where did you learn this? Did you go to car maintenance school? He goes, yeah, man, you don't have to if you have a smartphone because every single question. And, and he just typed in, he goes, Lexus 450SL, where is the boom? And then a YouTube video pops up. Yeah, wow. And, and he says, I've learned how to fix all cars just from watching YouTube. And then about three months ago, I was at a um, one of those uh, restaurants where they, they uh, what, what is it, when they cook at the table? And oh, like the Japanese? Yeah, the like, Japanese. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And this kid was just crushing it. And he was a little white kid. And he was, it looked like he was about 18, 19 years old. I said, where did you learn all these moves? I've seen this done 100 times. I said, you're amazing. Go, oh, YouTube. I learned every one of these moves <laughs> on YouTube. So, uh, so then I want to ask you another question. Um, so how much of this um, will the dental assistant get to do? Uh, depending on your state regulations, of course, you know, your doctor time on a case can be as little as, you know, 30 to 60 minutes. They can do tons and tons and tons of stuff depending on your regulations. So if, if, in my state, they're allowed to do a whole bunch. Plus I have an EFTA who helps me. So it's even more, uh, that they can do so but most uh, doctors what they could do is they could you know place the brackets and just do IPR and that's it the rest could all be assistant time more or less so your uh, per appointment adjustment time doctor time could be five five minutes ten minutes depending on how much you want to talk to the patient so it can be very assistant driven and it's not difficult to teach the assistants how to do it it's actually very straightforward. So a lot of it is, is assistant driven. So are you recommending that um, this two day course you bring your assistants? Yeah, in fact, we allow you to bring an assistant for free. And then, you know, you should bring as many as you feel would help you uh, in your practice. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And, and, and any, any way to quantify what percent is your assistance in Ohio versus you? I mean, is it uh, half and half, 80, 20, no, 90, it's 10? Probably, nowadays, uh, my assistant probably does. Um, 80%, if not more, of, of, the, of the, you know, actual chair time work. Right on. Um, so then um, diagnosing and treatment planning. So this dentist is, uh, right now I've told him to be thinking of the last 20 new patients he got. Uh, you talk about 25 to 45. They missed the ortho window in high school. Um, they don't like a certain tooth. Um, it, what, what, I guess what I want you to do is, what would be the lowest hanging fruit case to start? What would be a case to start to where, come on, dude, you got to at least do that. You're a doctor. How could you not do this case? Describe the low-hanging fruit ortho six-month braces case. Um, it's actually going to be a, a, a class one or a class two case 
with mild to moderate crowding or mild to moderate spacing uh, and uh, about 50% deep bite, 50% vertical dental overlap. Those are your, you know, pretty much, you know, the most straightforward cases you're going to get. Uh, you're going to be able to treat them very safely. Those three cases are very predictable to treat. You just kind of follow the sequences that we've set up for you, and those are that, that is the low-hanging fruit. Okay, so then you're going to do uh, an ortho workup. You're going to do a pano and a ceph and a tracing? Yeah, that's, that's recommended. A lot of people teaching this style of treatment don't recommend CEPHs. Um, I think they're better for medical legal protection as well as diagnosis. I'll show you which cases are safer without and which cases to absolutely not treat without them, but it's always best to have them. Yeah, we take photos, models, um, and, and our films as well. So you're doing a full ortho workup then? I do, yes. Yes, and what percent of the CEPs do you trace personally versus do you send them out to be traced? Now I send them out to be traced. I'll, I'll, I'll trace one here and there. In the beginning, sometimes it's nice to trace your first handful, but really the important thing is interpreting the data you get back. And with what we use, we only look at four items. Okay, when I'm doing a traditional orthodontic case, I look at about 16 items. But for PowerProx 6 month braces, since our goals are a bit different, our goal, anterior cosmetic correction, we only look at four factors. And it's basically just to rule out what I call danger cases, cases that can end up being an open bite or, a, or an underbite inadvertently that are kind of hidden beneath the surface. So it's really to help spot those cases. Now, those cases aren't necessarily hard to treat if you know they're coming, but it helps, especially the beginning uh, doctor, you know, learning orthodontics to help avoid those kind of cases. So what are the four things you're looking? I look at the skeletal class, the maxillary bone to the mandibular bone. I look at the skeletal vertical dimension, the upper face height to the lower face height. And I look at the upper and lower incisor angles. Okay, and uh, so this uh, what so this dentist listening in this car, he's thinking, okay, I, I don't have a, pa I, I have a pano, I don't have a cell. Mm -hmm. What would you, what would you tell that person? I would tell them I would absolutely not treat any case that does not have um, at least three and preferably four to five millimeters of vertical dental overbite, because those are the cases that tend to be more of like the hidden class threes or hidden open bites that can pop open or go into anterior cross bite for you. And, and so say this then as uh, say it's, okay, I have a pano, I have a SAF. I'm thinking about it getting a CBCT. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, uh, uh, what, are, what are you, are you doing your own pano SAFs? Is, is it a CBCT? Is there, if you're going to get a CBCT to start doing some surgical guides for implants, is there a CBCT that, uh, that, that you use or what, what are you using for your pano SAF? I use just a, a digital pan and SAF. CBCTs weren't as big when I got that. Um, so it's not an upgradable one, but my oral surgeon has one, my periodontist has one, so I can still refer out if I have to look at, you know, an impacted canine or something like that. But even if you have a oral surgeon or a periodontist in your town and you absolutely need to get a ceph slice out of one, most of them let you do one so that if you're not ready yet to, to buy your own or do anything, you can, you can get it done. So you, so who do you say you get at your CBC there? A periodontist and who was the other one you said? Or, or an surgeon? oral surgeon, if so, I need one. Yeah. yeah. So now, how how many times a month do you send someone to your periodontist or an oral surgeon for a CBCT? Rarely. Really? And then it's rare. And when you do, when you do, um, do they they charge you for that? They just charge the patient directly. Okay. So it's a you know whatever it is a couple few hundred dollars and I don't I don't get them for for power proc six month braces I only use them for more involved comprehensive cases where we have multiple impacted teeth or something funky. Yeah, you know, a lot of kids tell me, you know, they, they really want a CBCT and, but they just don't have the money and it, you know, a lot of them had doubled their student loan debt. And it's funny because oh, yeah. I'm telling them all, you, you don't need one, you need access to one. Right, And, and yeah. so, you know, you gotta be street smart, not book smart. Yeah. And, and if you and if you really want a CBCT every once in a while, I bet there's nine of them within 20 miles of your office. And, and a lot and of big cities, a lot of big cities have radiology centers too. So you can send out for all types of different films and views. And you know, and if you listen to the public, if you listen to the public, like you'll always hear them say, well, he needed to do this die scan of my kidney or this or that. And, and then I had to drive 40 miles over to Glendale to have it done. So if you need that one CBCT, I mean, you can talk a consumer to drive 40 minutes if it's a one-time deal. Now they're not going right. to want to go there every week for the rest of their life, but Driving half an hour for a, a medical test is, is just nothing for uh, a consumer. 
Um, no. So um, I've only got you for five more minutes, and so I, I want you to address this. Um, um, it, it's just humans are they're, they're afraid, and I um, I, I got to tell you my my ortho story. And the best thing that happened to me was uh, for some reason I noticed when I went to the CE courses that everyone who had their FAGD and their MAGD. Uh, they they were just better dentists. I mean, it was just obvious. They were CE junkies. Like you said, your dad was a CE junkie and was driving you to courses in dental school. So I signed up for him by FAGD because I wanted to be like them. And I did not want to learn ortho. And I did not want to learn implants. And I wanted to take all my courses on fillings and crowns and root canals. And it forced me to, to in order to get my FAGD, I had to take classes like yours. And uh, and my God, it, it was just love at first sight. I don't think I've ever, ever felt, taken something in a specialty and, uh, and, and it's also interesting, like, um, I was at a convention not very long ago and, uh, this guy was, uh, complaining the night before that tomorrow he had to take one on, uh, antibiotics and, you know, and, and all this stuff for his FAGD. And it was just going to be on prescription. He was just dreading it. And then that night he was just lit up on fire because these, <laughs> these structural programs yeah, force yeah. you to do things that you weren't going to do. And I wish I could force my listeners to go spend two days with you. I wish I could force them because um, I've known you for 20 years on the boards and your 15,000 posts. You, you don't have people saying, oh yeah, that was good. You have raving fans. <laughs> I mean, you have life-changing fans. I mean, you do, you're, you're a rock star in dentistry. And so <laughs> many of these, be, and, and the other thing is back to that mental health. Um, your patients aren't gonna take care of their teeth if they have a bad self-image of their teeth. If they think their teeth are ugly and crowding and dark and they hate their teeth, they're not gonna take care of them. And so, you know, you need that. But the thing with the dentist, um, if you're going into the office every day and all you're doing is fillings and crowns and fillings and crowns and fillings and crowns and you say, now it's a job and I'm just trading time for money and I'm burned out and fried, God, learn something new. Go learn how to place an implant. Go learn how to do some ortho. I mean, I, I think ortho is fun. And, and I'll tell you another thing. Sometimes when you're tired and you're walking in and you see your next patient is like, you know, retreating a failed second molar root canal. And you're just like, ah, cause you, it's, it's a Pandora's box. You have no idea what you're going to get into, Yeah, yeah. but it is so, it is so refreshing to just say, oh, I have three ortho checks. I mean, that, that's like, that, that's like your own recess. I mean, that's just like, Hey, go get a cup of coffee. You could, you can text back your four boys and you, you got, you just got three, or, you know, three ortho checks in a row. I mean, it's, it's just fun. It's low key. I, I, I like to say, I wish I could reach through iTunes right now and and make you go to Rick DePaul. Um, and you're a life changer. You're a role model for him. Uh, dude, I only got you for two and a half minutes, so I want you to give your best two and a half minute close to get, you know, if you keep doing the same thing every day and expecting a different result, you're insanity. They're burned out. They're fried. Their practice has been flat for 10 years. They need something. They need to add something. They need to spice something up. I know adding six month braces is gonna do it. Give them two minutes to close to why they should come see you. Well, as you said, I mean, it's just so much fun and it's so low stress. It's just such a different environment when someone actually wants you to, to see them. They're excited to come into the office. They're not dreading it. They don't say, we never hear, I hate the dentist. We never hear, how much is my insurance gonna pay? I wanna get this over with. It just doesn't happen. They're very excited. Look how much my teeth moved this month. They look great. They're feeling so much better. Not only that, they're bringing you gifts. You see the smile on their face light up. And it really makes you and your staff, your whole team gets excited to see these patients. So it brings up the morale of the entire office. It goes way beyond, you know, increasing your, your profitability. You're having fun again. Okay, and it's how dentistry should have been, but you know, unfortunately insurance dictated a lot of that drag down. The patients are excited to see you. You're helping them a lot, you're changing their lives, you're just making them so happy, so excited, and it's so easy to implement this into your practice. And so many people want it, they're just gonna come to your office in droves, and it's just gonna really create that fantastic working environment. You're gonna love going to work, Okay, you're not going to have to worry about dreading about that that root canal retreat where the guy's going to flip you off. It costs how much? No, this patient's like, oh my God, my teeth are so straight. I love them. I told 10 people about you this week. That's what you hear with this kind of treatment. We hear it every single day. And on the last note, uh, I hope I don't get her name wrong. How's your adorable, lovely wife? Is it Marcy? Margie. Margie. Oh, I'm sorry. Margie. I'm sorry. Uh, she is adorable. I don't, I don't know who I like more, you or her. She's just a, 
I think she's the, behind every successful man is a successful woman. Dude, I think she's more successful than you. There would be no power proc six month braces if it wasn't for Margie. She does all the hard work. I get to have fun talking to people, teaching doctors. She's the one that does all the hard work behind the scenes. You know, she runs the whole show. She runs the practice. She does everything. So without Margie, I would not be sitting here talking to you. There's absolutely no way I could ever do this on my own. So she actually deserves a ton, if not like 99%. Please, the credit please that. don't tell her I called her Marcy. Please, please lie to her and said, Howard said, hi. You just have to say what I said. Uh, Not a problem. So then my last question that we're over, over time is, uh, dude, every time I see you on uh, post a picture of yourself, you're eating like a 5,000 calorie dish. How do, how do you stay looking so good when you're uh, when you are uh, always eating gourmet foods <laughs> at fancy restaurants? How does that happen? Well, you know, you may notice that I only post pictures of me with food when I'm away teaching classes. When I'm home, I don't eat like that, and I, I tend to exercise like a madman. So if I didn't do those things, I would weigh about 600 pounds, no doubt about it. So Okay. Uh, and with that note, we're out of time. All I'm going to say is run, don't walk to go see Rick DePaul Jr. with Six Month Braces. Dude, you're a life changer. Thank you for all that you do for dentistry. Thank you for all that you do for Dental Town, and thank you for all that you do uh, for making so many dentists get back into it again. And thank you so much, Howard, for Dentaltown and everything you've done as well. Life changer for you. My life would be totally different without you. All right, buddy. I can't wait to see you again sometime. We'll see you. Take bye care, bye. my man.